Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Aaron Goodman. I'm one of the, I do bone marrow transplant at UCSD, but I also um, do a lot of histiocytic or Erdheim Chester and related uh, disorders. And uh, just briefly how I got into that, um, like most uh, physicians, uh, I'd never heard of the disease till quite late in my training till I was actually a fellow. So that's already, you know, eight years after being an MD. Uh, and uh, I took a fellowship here at UCSD to train in hematology and bone marrow transplant. And uh, Dr. Kurzrock, who's no longer with us at UCSD, but um, she was uh, was at MD Anderson and came here and had a, an interest in precision medicine and, 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 and Erdheim Chester was a particular interest to her. And so I worked in her clinic and uh, that's where I learned about this disease. And uh, 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 after you see one patient with Erdheim Chester disease, you've seen more than 99.9% .9 of other physicians. So, uh, and I was interested in the disease and the fact that we could really treat the disease and, and, and make patients better with quite amazingly, just with pills. Uh, and I, I became passionate about the disease and definitely raising awareness, which is why this organization is so great. Cause, uh, although a very rare disease, uh, uh it's an incredibly treatable disease and patients do amazingly well now, uh, with the modern therapies. So, uh, I think really the biggest hurdle for the disease is, is training physicians, educating physicians to recognize the disease. And, and Erdheim Chester's, it's one of those diseases, kind of like other rare diseases where it's got everything against it to be diagnosed, right? It, it's incredibly rare. Uh, they don't teach it in medical school because it's one of a gazillion other rare diseases. Uh, it presents across every medical specialty, right? It can present with neurologic uh, brain, uh, heart, uh, abdominal masses, kidney, uh, skin lesions. Um, so it's not unique to one specialty. And so not only is it rare, no, no specialty really took ownership of it. And that's kind of a, a, a disaster for late presentations of disease and, 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 and not uh, getting appropriate therapy to patients early enough. So uh, uh, it's very uh, rewarding to get to talk to you patients and educate other physicians about the disease. And I think raising awareness of the disease is the most important thing. Really, if you can, you know, doctors don't need to know how to treat the disease. Uh, the, you know, they, they need to know how to diagnose the disease. Because even though I'm the specialist that treats a lot of Erdheim Chester, I'm not the one making the diagnosis, right? Someone else in the community has seen this uh, patient and go, maybe this is Erdheim Chester disease, get to Dr. Goodman. That's usually what happens. And that's the doctor that saves their life, is, is that the, the thought crosses their mind. And how we expand that to physicians is, it's challenging. I, I think about that. I deal with a lot of rare diseases, um, you know, and every rare disease has its own advocacy group, uh, like Castleman's disease. And, um, you know, I sometimes see patients where they're like, why don't physicians know about it? And I'm not making excuses for physicians, but there's thousands of other rare diseases just like Erdheim Chester. So um, I don't know the best, best rest, uh, but, but organizations like this are part of it. And I encourage to keep doing what we're doing. So now we'll get to the talk, but that's kind of how the story of how I got into this disease and it's kind of come full circle. It's great that I get to talk to patients about it. So uh, first, welcome to San Diego. I, I'm sure some of you live here, uh, but this is a Pacific beach looking down Mission, Mission Beach, I live about a mile from that area, um, um, and it's it's a lovely city, uh, and um, if you're just in town briefly, I recommend uh, Oscar's uh, Fish Tacos. I frequent there quite uh, just about every week. There's like three locations, uh, but the best fish tacos, like you think you've had fish tacos, but if you haven't had Oscar's, you don't know what real fish tacos are, okay? So so go to, uh, go to Oscar's, that's my plug. Um, I don't get money from Oscar's. Um, so these were some uh, common questions that I hope to, to answer. Uh, uh, th the goal is at the end of this 15 minutes, or however long I talk for, is that you leave as patients understanding this. And if you don't, I failed. And you can tell me afterwards. So is Erdheim Chester disease a cancer? What are mutations? Will I ever be in remission? What are signs and symptoms of Erdheim uh, Chester disease? And can I ever stop treatment? And then another question is, how often do I need scans and surveillance and all these things? Well, you know, I'm going to go over my approach. Uh, uh, and how I basically educate patients on the disease as if I were seeing you in clinic. And, and you know, I just, I'm warning you, you will hear my approach and what I think. Um, and you might be like, well, that's not how my doctor's doing it. There is no right way to do this. This is an incredibly rare disease. And uh, uh, um, uh, there are some commonalities in practice, but don't, I don't want you to take it like my doctor's doing it wrong. Where the, you know, uh, there's no one right way to do this. Okay. So let's start with a case and I'll, uh, 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 I always like cases. It, it makes it more interesting. So a 52-year-old uh, gentleman presented with eye swelling. So MRI, that's a type of scan, showed retroorbital. So that's behind the eye uh, lesions. 
Um, and um, so there were these masses behind the eyes, bilateral, uh, two, uh, two centimeters. Um, and it was pushing on one of the nerves called the optic nerve, which can cause uh, visual disturbances, okay? So um, that's an unusual presentation. And uh, he underwent uh, retro uh, decompression, so an ophthalmologist saw him. And um, the pathology came back uh, consistent with Erdheim Chester disease. And you know, you know all these markers, but these are what the pathologists, when they look under the microscope, they have these tools that help them identify all the different cell types. And they look at all these numbers and stainings. And you don't need to know that. That's for doctors like me to remember, okay? So he then underwent staging. When we say staging, that's to define the extent of the disease. Uh, um, and then in this disorder, as we'll talk about, the whole body can be affected. So staging is quite intense, especially at diagnosis. And it's typically where we'll do a full body PET scan. Uh, and just for those who don't know what a PET scan is, that allows us to look at a three-dimensional, the structures of the body. It also, you get injected with a little sugar molecule, it's called FDG. And the, uh, the Erdheim Chester cells, they metabolize that sugar more than the regular cells, so they'll light up on the scan, and that's how the scan works and helps us identify. And in this particular patient, uh, they had lesions kind of uh, classic for, for Erdheim Chester. It was surrounding the kidney, and we call that a hairy kidney because on the scans, it looks like the kidneys have hair surrounding it, and the long bones were infiltrated, which is almost seen in every patient with Erdheim Chester disease. Enough so if I see a patient with a diagnosis of Erdheim Chester disease and there's no long bone involvement, I question the diagnosis. And the patient was started on bemorafenib, which we'll talk about. Okay, so that's a typical presentation. So is Erdheim Chester disease a cancer? So um, it is, and I'm gonna, you know, I think to understand Erdheim Chester disease, you first have to understand what cancer is. And cancer is actually hard to explain. And um, I think in five years, I, I've come up with kind of a way to explain it to patients. So uh, we all maybe we all took biology at one point. I don't know how many took biology. I, I know this table took biology. Okay, good. Um, uh, when, when you take high school biology, uh, you learn about cells, okay? And cells are not things you can see. You need a microscope. But think of cells as little bricks, and they're the building blocks to all the organs in our body, okay? So our heart's made of a bunch of cells, our kidneys. So that's what cells are. In each cell, there is something called DNA, okay? And DNA, just think like Jurassic Park, you know, that little cartoon sketch when they're at the Jurassic Park movie, it, you know, uh, DNA is the code, okay? And it sits in all the cells and it's the code. It tells the cells what to do, okay? So when I say what to do, it tells the cells how to grow, how to divide, what proteins, what functions it needs to do. And just like computer code, Sometimes the code can get kind of screwed up, okay? So as we age, the, the DNA, the code can get errors in it, okay? And when I say errors, the medical word or scientific word is called mutations. So little changes in the code, we call those mutations, okay? And actually this is happening all the time. Uh, as we speak, as I speak, these mutations, I mean, it's quite amazing actually the human body. We make gazillions of cells a day, blood cells and all these things. And there's even more DNA. And as you can imagine with that much production, there's gonna be errors in the DNA made. It's just, a, you know, nothing's perfect, but the body has a lot of mechanisms or abilities to get rid of the errors, okay? But because we all live a long time now and, um, what, what can happen in some individuals, actually a lot of individuals are diagnosed with cancer, is errors can happen in the DNA and you get multiple errors, okay? Enough so where the cell actually changes its function. The code is so different now that the cell doesn't behave like a normal cell. So now the cell maybe can grow faster than its normal cells or it learns how to spread somewhere it shouldn't. That's what a cancer is. It's your own cells, they have faulty code and it makes the cells misbehave. Does that make sense? So that's a, a very basic explanation of what a cancer is, okay? And I think when that happens in a, in a lung cell, you know, that's a lung cancer, that's fairly, uh, most patients can understand that. But what the hell is an Erdheim Chester cell? I mean, like, that's confusing. I mean, I, you know, so we're going to now go into that. So if we all understand cancer, let's try to, um, um, oh, this was some, I didn't even go through my pictures. This is just the, we all learned this in high school biology, but DNA is the code. Okay, and the, it, it's code for proteins. So your body makes proteins from the DNA, it reads the DNA to make proteins, but the errors or the mutations happen in that DNA, okay? So cancer is a disease of faulty DNA. Another thing, not, not mutations that you can pass on to like your kids. These are things that happen as you age, okay? That's a different story when there are diseases that you can pass on, but not this one or most cancers, okay? 
So take your, take your understanding of cancer now, put it in the backdrop. Let's now try to explain what Erdhan Chester is. Um, go to the butcher shop. Um, at the center of the ham hock is uh, the bone marrow, right? That's red, okay? And uh, that's the factory for your blood cells, okay? So where's your blood made? It's made in the bone marrow. And uh, when I say blood, I mean more than just red blood cells. Red blood cells carry oxygen, uh, but your blood also makes little platelets. So when you cut yourself, you get a scab and it makes white blood cells, okay? We're gonna focus on white blood cells. So white blood cells are made in the bone marrow and the white blood cells represent your immune system. So your immune system is your blood and it's made in the bone marrow, okay? And in the bone marrow, sits a very special cell, a cell that's very near and dear to me, given what I do in stem cell transplant, it's called a stem cell. And it's, it's a, uh, the fancy word is hematopoietic stem cell. Just think of it as blood stem cell. It's the cell that makes all the other blood cells, okay? And you don't need to know this chart at all, unless you're a hematologist or a scientist, but there's many different types of white blood cells, okay? And we're gonna focus on one particular type. It's just called a monocyte, okay? A monocyte, a type of white blood cell, made in the bone marrow. When it leaves the bone marrow, this monocyte, a type of white blood cell, goes to the tissue. So it goes to the, everywhere in your body, okay? Uh, and it, once it enters the tissue, we change the name of it. It's now called a histiocyte. And I know many of you now have heard of histiocytes. So now we know what a histiocyte is. It's a, comes from the bone marrow, type of white blood cell, and it's that white blood cell when it enters the tissue. And we now have called that a histiocyte. And there are many different types of histiocytes, okay? Erdheim Chester disease is a cancer of those cells. So it's a cancer of these blood cells, the monocytes becoming histiocytes. So it's actually a blood cancer, even though it doesn't present like leukemia and lymphoma, things that we think of blood cancer, but it is. It's a cancer of these cells that are made in the bone marrow. And I think the reason, now you know why this disease kind of presents so weird, right? With eyes, these histiocytes go everywhere. And when you have a cancer of that cell that can go all the different tissues of the body and do what it's supposed to do, you can start seeing these weird disease manifestations. That was a lot. I hope that so cancer disorder of mutations. And in, in, in this particular cancer, it's mutations in these monocytes, these pre, you know, these prehistiocytic blood cells that are made in the bone marrow. Okay. And what do histiocytes do? They're kind of like, I think I have it in the next slide. What is a histiocyte? So does anyone know this movie? Bonus? No one? Bill and Ted? Okay. Yeah, that's actually a young Keanu Reeves. Um, so histiocytes, they're like the garbage man, okay? Uh, 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 their job is to eat stuff and just, they do a lot, I'm sure, you know, learn, they do more than just that. I'm simplifying it, but they're, they're, uh, they're, uh, they, they, they're scavengers and they chew up debris and all sorts of stuff. And again, they arrive from these cells that are made in the bone marrow. And there's many different types of histiocytes, okay? And Clearly, you don't need to know this. Oh, because there's so many different types of histiocytes, you, there are so many different types of histiocytic cancers, okay? And this is where you get all these soup of, of different histiocytic malignancies that just about no doctor even knows other than a select few who are dedicated to learning and treating patients with histiocytic malignancies. Okay. So now we know that, yes, erdheim chester disease is a cancer, Okay, and we know that cancers are abnormal cells that wreak havoc on our body. And we've now learned that it's particularly a cancer, a blood cancer from these monocytes that are made in the bone marrow that become histiocytes. So we're educated on that. So what are the signs and symptoms of Erdheim Chester? And this is actually what's most important for medical students to learn about so they can think about that. All I ask is the student be like, maybe it's this. If we, if we get to that in the medical student, then we've achieved our goal uh, and they'll start thinking about this disease. Okay. It can do everything. So I, I, does this come up good? Yeah. So, so I think in 95 to 100% of patients, they'll present with long bone involvement, particularly the long bones, like the femur, the ones in the legs. And it's usually symmetric, meaning it's the same on both sides. So like, for example, I'll have patients present to my clinic with neurologic disorder. Okay. Um, the, maybe a biopsy showed histiocytes. It's confusing but someone goes, maybe this is right on Chester. And then I'll get a PET scan and if it lights up with these bones right here, that's classic. It's gonna be Erdheim Chester disease. So that's what helps me as a clinician starting to diagnose the disease. I always look for that. And to be honest, um, my personal opinion is if you don't see that long bone involvement, I really start questioning whether it's Erdheim Chester and not just some other histiocytic malignancy. You know, and, and, and to be honest, it, 
ends up not mattering. They're all treated fairly similar, but whether we give it the classic name Ernheim chest disease. So that's seen in all patients. And then a lot of patients, um, there's a reasonable amount of patients that present with neurologic involvement. And I usually, so brain, and I like dividing that into two types. One is the pituitary gland. And that's part, it's this little like thing that hangs off the brain. Um, and it's the master regular regulator of all the hormones in your body, okay? And particular, there's a part of the pituitary, the back part, we call it the posterior, that actually controls water retention and urination. And um, a lot of patients with Erdheim chester disease will start presenting, they go, hey, doc, I'm peeing a lot. Uh, uh, we call that polyuria. Uh, uh, and that's a, the diagnosis is diabetes insipidus, not diabetes mellitus, the sugar one, but diabetes insipidus from peeing a lot. And um, that's due to destruction of that gland from the, 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 the cancer cells, actually. And that's a common presentation. Um, really, an adult with new onset diabetes insipidus, my goal is for endocrinologists who are usually seeing these doctors to have this on the differential, uh, especially if there's some atypical features. If I see diabetes insipidus and long bone involvement, it's going to be Erdheim Chester disease, or there's a related disorder called Langerhans that it could be also. Um, some patients can present with um, frank, you know, parenchyma or in the tissue of the brain, uh, uh, where they can present with trouble speaking, trouble walking. It can even look like multiple sclerosis in some patients, um, uh, and that can uh, uh, result in delay of diagnosis. Um, uh, I have, uh, I don't think they're here. So I, I have, a, it's a very rewarding patient. So I have a patient, um, it can present with what we call interstitial lung disease, which is um, a group of disorders where like, the lungs are infiltrated by the cancer cells themselves. And as most patients, doctors who treat interstitial lung disease, it's a horrible disease because we don't have many good therapies for and other than maybe a lung transplant, a lot of patients succumb to interstitial lung disease. I had a patient who presented with interstitial lung disease for five years, was on home oxygen at very high levels, and um, they were ready to call it quits. There wasn't, you know, there's no treatment for interstitial lung disease. A smart doctor at, a local, at another university uh, demanded a lung biopsy, and they saw histiocytes and then got him in touch with me, and we did scans, and the guy had Erdogan Chester disease. Uh, we put him on Erdogan Chester disease, we put him on uh, Vemurafenib, and he's off oxygen, and like, it's amazing. It's a miracle. So that's a guy that was saved because someone thought of the diagnosis, which is why it's so important, as I said, and stressed to think about these things. Uh, other uh, renal insufficiency, usually it's not from kidney failure. Usually these, these cells surround the uh, kidney and then they the kidneys drain into these things called the ureters that then you pee out they can get obstructed uh, by the inf infiltrating cells that surround the kidney uh, we call that hydronephrosis so that's a common presentation also okay so a lot of stuff uh, it can it could cover the big vessels of the heart uh, so a lot of patients can have heart involvement okay and this is just a chart showing the degree of, of when patients present uh, 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 basically new, nearly uniform bone involvement, uh, diabetes insipidus is in half of patients. So the peeing a lot, neuro, uh, neurologic involvement, 40%. Uh, so a lot of things. Okay. So now we know how it presents. Someone asked, what are mutations? Well, I kind of explained what mutations are. So mutation is the word we use when there's an error in the DNA. That's a mutation. Most mutations actually don't cause any problems, but occasionally a mutation can result in the body making a mutant protein. So th that thing, that's the protein. And you can imagine if the code screwed up, it can make a new, what we call a novel protein. Uh, well, a protein that has an abnormal function, okay? Just on pure luck of how the mutation was, okay? So that's what a mutation is. It's in the DNA. And then occasionally it can make a protein that doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. Very fancy chart. Please, you don't really need to remember this. I'm going to try to explain this. Um, so in Erdheim-Chester disease, um, about half of patients have a specific mutation in the DNA where it makes a new protein, uh, uh, so there, uh, a new BRAF protein. So BRAF is a protein we all make, and it's involved in cell function. So cells require BRAF to signal through the cell and work normally. Okay, and that, that BRAF is only turned on when there's appropriate signals from the body. It's very tightly controlled. The body doesn't want BRAF on when it doesn't need to be on. Make sense? Okay. If you are unlucky enough to get a mutation in BRAF, it can turn the switch on and it can be stuck in the on position. 
So if BRAF stuck in the on position, it can't turn off. And now the body's no longer regulating it. So if it's stuck in the on position, the cell's just proliferating and wreaking havoc and it can't be turned off. So a mutation happens in half of patients with, hit, with Erdogan Chester disease where it makes a funny BRAF and the BRAF stuck in the on position and it can't be turned off. Make sense? If it can't be turned off, well, then the cell is going to proliferate and cause Erdogan Chester disease. In the other half of patients with Erdogan Chester disease, they don't have a BRAF mutation, but they have mutations and all this other stuff that you don't need to remember, but it's all related to the BRAF and we can target it using a different medicine. Okay. And we've done great work out of Sloan Kettering. Um, we've even done some of the work at UCSD where we can detect these mutations. If you have a good enough panel, you'll detect BRAF in 50%. And then some of our work and, and, and other universities, you can detect, with if you have good enough sequencing and you look at enough different genes, you can detect mutations in 100% of patients. And it's all related to this stuff, okay? So they realized this about 10 years ago, okay? And they're like, oh my God, Erdogan Chester disease, it's not a reactive inflammatory disorder, it's a cancer, there's a mutation. And what they realized was the mutation in BRAF, a smart doctor or a few doctors were like, this is the same mutation that we see in melanoma. So what is melanoma? Melanoma is a aggressive skin cancer, okay? And melanoma is way more common, although still kind of rare, but more common than, way more common than Erdogan Chester. It's common enough where pharmaceuticals want to make money and developed a drug that would treat melanoma with BRAF mutations. And they did that. And the drug was called Vemurafenib and there's a sister called Dibrafenib. And so a doctor was like, well, this same mutation exists in Erdogan Chester disease. We have a drug that works in melanoma, okay? We have a drug that works in melanoma very well that has the same mutation. Why don't I just give it to a patient with Erdogan Chester disease and see what happens? And some could say, well, that's kind of experimenting, but let's, let's be honest, about 10, 15 years ago, the treatments for Erdogan Chester disease were not good. Uh, we had, we guessed basically, we had interferons, chemotherapy, and the, you know it didn't work so well. Uh, I mean, and they had side effects. And um, the first case report, it was like a complete response. It was like a home run. The patient did amazing. And they did amazing enough where doctors all got together and actually did an appropriate clinical trial uh, where they took patients with Erdogan Chester disease, uh, 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 quite a big study for such a rare. They collaborated across many universities and gave a bunch of patients Vemurafenib. And the response rate was amazing. It was uh, close to 100%, okay? And this was a home run, and that actually led to the FDA approval of vemurafenib uh, uh, for Erdheim Chester disease. Um, and I will say, um, I'm you know, precision medicine, you hear a lot about it in the news. For most, it's not a home run, actually. For most, um, the drugs work not so great. I think Ela can attest to this. Um, there are very few diseases where where precision medicine is a home run. Um, and the other home run happens to be in another blood cancer, which is why I think it's very fascinating. There's a, a leukemia called CML, and this was a leukemia um, that also had no good treatments and patients would all die in three to five years. And uh, they found a specific key to, to that disease. And now all patients with CML live a normal life expectancy. And it's, it's, our, it's interesting to me that a relate, another blood disorder that's kind of related also is exquisitely sensitive to, to single agent or, or, or you know, giving a one pill can really make the disease in most patients go away or remain stable for what we think maybe is an indefinite amount of time. So I think what you would ask next is, well, what about the patients who don't have that BRAF mutation? Okay, well, that's the other 50% of patients. Uh, but from various studies, they all have uh, mutations in another pathway. Um, that is related, but can be targeted with a different class of drugs. They're called MEK inhibitors. The two are trametinib and cobimetinib. And those work in all the other patients, okay? And what's amazing enough is if, if you have a BRAF mutation, both classes of drugs will work. You can give the BRAF inhibitor or the MEK inhibitor. If you don't have the BRAF mutation, the BRAF drugs don't work, uh, and the sh patients should not be on them if they don't have a BRAF mutation. But the MEK inhibitors do work. So I have now had a few patients where we figure out they have Erdogan Chester disease, but like they're very ill. I don't have like the four weeks to wait for the sequencing to come back. We put them on a MEK inhibitor. I know it's gonna work in everyone. Uh, and, and then when we get further sequencing back, we can uh, change things. Does that make sense? Uh, literally 
in my experience, I have not had a patient where these drugs have not worked. And in the literature, it's basically 95%. As Ela will talk about, there are, they're not perfect. There's toxicities that can result in uh, 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 us having to change doses or stop it, but they seem to work in just about everyone, okay? Someone asked how there are further, there's lots of studies uh, in the works looking at um, um, related uh, uh, drugs that target these pathways uh, um, and uh, uh, other pathways involved in the disease. So lots of different drugs, which is great because not so much that I think patients will become resistant to these drugs or hopefully not, but some patients do have side effects. It's always nice to be able to switch to other medications that might be more suitable for the patient. So will I ever be in remission? That's a tough question. So um, yes, it's, you know, how do, what, do we, what do we classify as a remission? Uh, uh, your disease stops progressing, um, hopefully looks better on a scan, but most importantly, hopefully you feel better, right? That's the whole goal of what we do in oncology is either you feel better or live longer. If you're on a drug that does neither of those things, then it's quite useless, right? Um, so uh, uh, most patients do feel better and usually you stop the progression of the disease. So that is a remission. Now, how long will the remission last? Um, I want to say hopefully indefinitely. Um, we don't know. We've only been using these drugs now for about 10 years or a little bit less. Um, there are rare reports of acquired resistance and being able to switch to another drug, but it seems to be a very rare scenario. Um, but um, it's possible that resistance could develop, but we just don't know yet. Okay. But in my experience, and most of these drugs seem to work indefinitely. Okay. And this is, I will skip that. Can I ever stop treatment? We don't know. Okay. Um, we don't know. Uh, my personal belief is probably not, but I don't think it's unreasonable, especially if you're having a lot of side effects and doing really well, to stop and see what happens and get close follow-up and if it comes back or something starts changing, get back on the medicine, you know? Uh, um, I will say in the related disease that I talked about, CML, that leukemia, if you asked me 10 years ago, I would have said you could never stop taking your, your leukemia pill. Well, guess what? They did studies where they stopped the medicine and in half of patients, they seemed to be cured. So I was wrong. Uh, um, and we'll probably never get those degree of studies in, in, in Rhode Island Chester, but, but maybe you can. And, and uh, CML changed my way of thought that you could never stop these drugs. So I haven't yet, but I would say in a patient who's in a beautiful remission for many years, I wouldn't be opposed to in my clinic stopping the drug. I wouldn't. I would just tell the patient I could be wrong and they could come back, you know, and we'll put you on the pill, okay? In CML, 50% of the patients were cured. The other 50%, the disease came back. And guess what they did? They put them all back on the pill and there was no, no nothing lost. So I, I'm hopeful, and I actually have been meaning to talk about this with other investigators, if that's something we can maybe consider a, a, a discontinuation or a stopping trial at some point in the future, because these drugs are very expensive and they're not benign. I mean, I would, I mean, I'm sorry, you have to be on, they're better than having the disease, but like they have issues and, and uh, less is more in medicine, okay? So that was my talk. Um, I wanna thank everyone. Uh, um, 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 uh, 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 for coming, then uh, Kurzweil's no longer here, and then an MD Anderson, uh, Dr. Janku. Uh, uh, any questions about anything? Yeah. yeah. I have not taken treatment eight years. Uh, I have not been moving in eight years. <laughs> Been remission since 2014. So I'm an example of my heart suffered and just near. So yeah, so you know, I'm not, I don't want you know, you're being taken care of by a doctor who, you know, I can't. I, 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 all I can say is in my clinic, um, and I think Elon knows this very well, I'm a less is more oncologist. Um, um, I, I, I'll tell you just what I do, and there's no wrong right way to do it. Uh, but for patients who have achieved a, a response to their therapy, especially a complete response, I largely stop imaging uh, with PET scans. Uh, I don't do surveillance PET scans. Uh, I think cumulative exposure to radiation is not a good thing. Um, and they're not helpful. Uh, you know, you'll sometimes see things you don't know what to do with and then do a biopsy and hurt the patient. So I largely stop doing uh, all surveillance imaging outside of the brain. The brain's a special place. Um, and if something grows and you don't know about it, that's real bad. And MRIs are not radiation. Um, as far as stopping the medicine, I have not had anyone on it for eight years yet. Uh, but I, I do suspect in my practice for those who are in a very good remission where uh, I think 
they can, t I, I would consider stopping it. Uh, uh, that would be, be how I would do it. I would also say that um, it's a disease, Erdogan Chester can be observed actually. You don't need treatment necessarily. You know, we have to apply the principles of, of cancer to Erdogan Chester. You know, if, the, if it's not hurting you or causing serious problems, then treatment's not gonna make you feel any better. And we don't know that we're making you, you know, necessarily, you know, so I have patients where I closely observe off therapy. Uh, uh, and I think that's a very reasonable approach. And people would say, how could you observe cancer? I do it all the time. I take care of a lot of patients with lymphomas, indolent lymphomas, uh, where we observe them for decades. And I suspect there's a population of patients with Erdogan Chester disease that can uh, be observed for quite some time. Particularly those are the patients that just have it in the bones who are asymptomatic and was picked up on some routine. I have had patients that have whatever's wrong with them and they get some routine scan and it picks up this disease and then they're sent to you and, you know, and I, I actually observe those patients. I think that's a perfectly appropriate strategy. So um, again, you know, we're still learning and, um, um, but that's how I handle it. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Uh, well, I'm 56 and that's almost my exact story. Yeah. I, told you I take two different drugs, but kind of uh, what you talked about, I take mechanisms, Tafanon, that's exactly my story. I've uh, been on them for 16 months and they changed my life. Um, and I, so here's the hard question. I'm 56. Do you keep saving for retirement or do you spend the retirement? I, I can't. I, I'm hopeful you will live a long, healthy life. I, I can't, you know, I, and I don't know the details of your particular case. So I, I'm telling my patients to expect. I believe it will be a normal life expectancy. Uh, 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 you know, don't read the what's online because what's online is the era of the interferons and clad ribbons. So uh, um, I'm hopeful and optimistic. Uh, uh, there are things that didn't go through. There are things you need to pay attention to in patients with urinary Chester disease. There are risks for, and we could talk about this after, other issues, uh, uh, um, including other types of cancers uh, that require special surveillance for these things. Uh, but I'm hopeful that most patients will live a, a normal life. And we have lots of stuff in the pipeline. So I think it's about minimizing toxicity from drugs, minimizing over scanning and things like that. Yes? My mom has um, mm -hmm. think one person has gone through it, it's about 10 years. So, so with Erdheim disease, I'm unaware of any cases of a genetic uh, that being said, um, and I don't want, I don't know any of the specifics. There's many leukemias. There are, we are learning more. Um, we used to think leukemia wasn't an inherited disease. There are, we are learning what we call germline mutations in certain genes that increase your susceptibility to myeloid or leukemia diseases. And um, Erdheim Chester disease, it actually is related to leukemia. It's a myeloid or that type of cell uh, process. So, um, you know, without knowing more specifics, it's probably not, but there are uh, there are families that have germline predisposition to developing blood cancers, and we're learning more about them as we speak. Uh, uh, and there's a uh, 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 dedicated panels and, and testing that can do for that. But you know, red flags are two first degree. Well, you know, relatives with blood cancers uh, or more at a young age, things like that. But I don't want to you know get you nervous for now. You know, I don't. I, I, that's just me thinking. There are though. Uh, I have not seen though of an Erdheim Chester yet reported with a, a germline mutation. Yes. So it depends if they need, if you don't need treatment and you're not getting treatment, it doesn't matter actually. I will say, I think all patients should have what's called a next generation sequencing panel. Um, those uh, tests for depending on the panel, 400 to 500 genes and in, just about everyone with Erdheim chest disease, we can find a mutation. Although one could argue it doesn't matter because everyone with Erdheim chest disease will respond even if they don't have a BRAF to a MEK inhibitor. Uh, but it's nice knowing and it's, it, it helps me feel better about the diagnosis. If I see a mutation and, and all the findings, then I can say I can feel comfortable with the diagnosis. So yes, I, I would recommend it. Most Now, in some patients with Erdheim chest disease, it's very hard to get tissue. Uh, maybe it's just in the brain. So we've successfully, and we've published, or you can do uh, testing of the blood and the DNA can be shed from the cancer cells into the blood. So I've diagnosed a few patients uh, uh, who had brain disease only by sending a blood sample and finding the BRAF mutation. Um, most oncologists I have, this stuff's now pretty available. So most oncologists, because they use it for lots of other cancers, 
can um, can get these panels. Uh, they're sent commercially. Like I mean, we do it in our own lab here, uh, but but you can send. There's plenty of commercial panels that oncologists and your oncologist can order it from the blood or from the tissue. There you go, plug for Morel and the NIH. Yeah, I, I do. I think everyone with this. I don't. A lot of cancer people think every cancer needs this testing. I don't. I do think this particular one does because we have very good treatments uh, 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 that target these pathways, and it helps us arrive at the diagnosis. So it's useful. Other questions? Yes. So when do you stop imaging after you finish? It's case by case. It depends how sick they were present. You know, this is a clinical decision I make, so it depends on numerous things. But um, I can just tell you what I don't do is I don't just image damage routinely because what I usually find in that scenario is, and we have plenty of studies, we're never gonna have it in our chest disease, but we have plenty of studies in lymphoma and other cancers where routine surveillance imaging is of no benefit to the patient other than causing anxiety, exposing them to radiation uh, and over-medicalizing the patient. So uh, what I usually do is, I, I, again, it depends. Outside of the brain, I mean, if they have bad, I do get a lot of MRIs, you know, uh, uh, but I'll usually, if they're in a complete remission, I'll usually get one more just to really feel good about that. Then I stop because if you order the scan and they're fine, then it doesn't help you. And then two months later, they might have a concerning symptom where you want to get the scan. So I have a low threshold to scan my patients, meaning if one of my patients comes in with a symptom, I'll take it very seriously and consider scanning where someone without a Chester, I wouldn't have. So I just, that's how I practice. Make sense? Well, the question was, how do you decide on when to stop scanning? Uh, and, I, and I stressed it's a case-by-case -case basis, how sick they were, uh, where the disease is, and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. how, much the, how much is the risk of organ failure? How much of the risk is organ failure? So you can't really, it, it, it depends on, everyone's erdem chester is a little different, and it depends on how long it's been ignored for. I mean, like that patient with, with lung issues, they had it for, it took, five or seven years for them to reach lung failure. Uh, so it wasn't rapid. It would be very unusual to have rapid organ failure with the disease, okay? Um, I have patients um, who have disease around their heart and are refusing treatment. And that was their decision. And we're watching it closely. I'm a little scared and it's nothing's happening. So, uh, um, you know, so it's, I don't think it's super rapid unlike some leukemias or lymphomas. I will say if the disease surrounds the vessels that drain your kidney, the ureters. Once it reaches a critical point, you could be fine with your kidneys and then reach kidney failure fairly fast. So again, it depends on many features. Good question. Uh, this patient, this is the best explanation she has ever heard. Oh, great. So the mutations can be detected two ways. Okay, so how do we detect the mutations? One is the tissue itself, we send the sample. Uh, it can even be sent from preserved tissue. It doesn't need to be fresh. We can send the, the, the tissue itself for sequencing. Uh, and I won't get into the specifics of that. And then the other way is you can do a blood test, just like a, a CBC or any other blood test. That's not as sensitive, but it can detect some patients where you don't have good tissue available. So those are the two ways we look uh, uh, for it. You know, that's hard for me to comment without specific, you know, I'd have to look at the images, you know, I, I don't want, I would be, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't comment on that without more details. Yeah, again, no, I think without, these are very, you know, there are so many leukemias, so it's very hard for me to make medical recommendations without the specifics. I will, all I can say is generalities in patients with truly bona fide uh, diagnosed blood cancers. If you see a few 
uh, in a family, I mean, that's un that is a little unusual because these are rare things and there are uh, potentially uh, not not Baraka, like there are a gazillion, you know, and it's very, very complex though, but that requires a very thorough genetic analysis of the family, the specific diagnoses and all those things. Yes? Very good question. I've actually thought about that, and um, I have performed actually a transplant on someone with Rodan Chester, but they also developed another blood cancer at the same time where there was an indication for transplant. And although I'll transplant, I actually it hasn't been published yet. There's, I do think it would cure the disease, but it's not a cure the way you think it is. It's one problem for another. Um, and um, as a transplanter, I use transplant when I absolutely have to. Uh, the problem with transplant itself is there's a significant risk of um, morbidity or death from the procedure, especially in patients with pre-existing organ problems, which is quite prevalent in Erdheim Chester disease. You know, um, so you could get sick real fast. And even in those who do well, uh, there's risks of long-term complications from the transplant, um, immune-related complications where they're on other pills that it's just what, so um, I would only reserve transplant for Erdheim, because we have such good therapies, although I recognize the hardships and the expenses and the toxicities, um, um, I would only reserve transplant for a cases where they develop other blood cancers that are life-threatening. Um, so I would, I wouldn't do it. Yes. So, 
has that sweet token to you to keep our asking you. And since that that goes out five and a half months, I had a big spur on this big man said to me, it's been my best the 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 brand of me. She can do the same for me. No, it's not the same. I, you know, I, I, that's unusual. I've not, you know, without knowing the specifics, um, I, I, I don't know. Usually, usually they're interchangeable. Uh, 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 I tend to just use verapamib because I mean, I'm comfortable with it. That's things doctors use, but they know how to use. So, um, but they should be interchangeable uh, unless there was a interaction with another medication that maybe was specific to that or absorption, but that, that I wouldn't know more than that. You're welcome. Thank you. So 